joined me up here to present the Vision 2020 update, um, specifically LCAP Goal 2, which is um, broad and challenging curriculum, and we know that we will deliver um, and accomplish a broad and challenging curriculum by making sure we have the robust dual language, biliteracy, and world language plan and pathways intact, and we want to report to you tonight how we're doing in that specific area, and um, the report tonight will focus on the English learners and the development of these dual language, biliteracy, world language pathways and what the plan is going forward, including student expectations, grade level goals, and the pathways for 21st century college career and community readiness. With that, um, and the LCAP specific goals, actions, and services, we try to demystify the goal 2.5.1, 2.5.2, 3, and 4. We get to talk specifically about them tonight, and we're happy to have you um, join us tonight to present where we are in this particular area. Thank you all for having us. Yes, thank you. Good evening, um, board members, President Herrera, and Superintendent Martin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our work with you. Um, so I'm going to begin with our goals and a vision for our dual language and world language pathways. Um, it is our vision that um, any student enrolled in a dual or world language pathway um, become fully um, bilingual and ultimately earn the seal of biliteracy. Um, of course, with the passing of Prop 58, uh, which was very, posi you know, very um, positive for us, and we're hoping that um, we will be able to continue to strengthen um, you know, and expand um, our dual language pathways. Um, but this year, we have um, focused um, in strategically formalizing the dual language, world language pathway. Um, since we adopted the language policy in 2009, San Diego Unified has been very responsive um, in opening um, uh, programs at, at the elementary level. So our focus this year has been primarily how are we going to ensure that the students that are in our elementary dual language by literacy programs have a pathway into middle school and ultimately into high school. Of course, we have a great um, you know, pathway currently in Area 5 in San Diego, in the San Diego cluster, and so we hope to be able to replicate that in other areas. Um, and so in, certainly, of course, with, like I said, with the prop, uh, passing of Prop 58, we're hoping to get more um, guidance from the state in terms of how that we're going to continue to expand and develop these programs, but we are still working strategically to be able to, you know, again, um, strengthen the pathways. And so, um, so it is our intent that every student enrolled in the dual language basically develop proficiency in um, English and the target language. Um, of course, they enhance um, or and or develop cultural proficiency. Um, in the past, uh, we have, um, students have historically um, had the opportunity to uh, gain or, or to get an award on the pathway, what we call the pathway awards in fifth and eighth grade. This year, we have added the kindergarten commitment award. We hope that um, students that enter our dual and biliteracy programs in kindergarten commit to remaining in the pathway um, all the way through 12th grade. So that's why we added the kindergarten um, award. And of course, ultimately, students have, you know, have had the opportunity to receive the seal of biliteracy when they're in 12th grade. So for our sealed by literacy, um, we has we looked at the data um, and we've looked, you know, at data since 2009. Um, we have had um, uh, pretty good data in terms of our 12th graders. Um, we have averaged about 100% of the 12th graders eligible for receiving the seal of by literacy, and they have, you know, they have gotten the seal of by literacy. Um, what we and so so what, as you can see here, last year approximately 400, actually exactly 460 students received the seal of biliteracy and that was a little bit over 100%. I think it was like 101 and that's because certain students may take the exam um, and so then that's why it's a little bit over 100%. But um, but then this year we have a, what we have identified approximately 371 and the goal is that these students will receive 100% of them will receive the seal of biliteracy. So what we're finding um, in, in terms of the structures that are currently in place, um, we have, been, have become really good at um, strategically targeting our 12th graders. Um, what we're looking at though is how do we target other students um, who are in the pipeline and, and not necessarily taking the required courses in the 12th grade but have taken it, which then increases the number of students who are eligible 
to receive the seal of biliteracy. So that is currently in the works. We are going to work with our data department so that they can um, give us a report of all students who are in 12th grade, who of course includes the 371, but then it would include any student who um, has met criteria from that when they were in 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. I'm hoping that making that, uh, that it's not too confusing, but basically we are open, we're broadening um, the way that we see the CL by literacy. So we're not going to only target students that are in the classes in the 12th grade, but obviously there's students that have had these classes and have and have the criteria to receive a seal of literacy, they just haven't been given the opportunity. Does that make sense? And so then now we're looking at approximately, when we looked at the data, the initial data, we're looking at about 1,200 students that could potentially be, um, you know, they're eligible for receiving the seal of literacy. And so we want to broaden that. So like I said, we're changing some of the structures and how we do, um, you know, how things have been running for a while, um, for the past, you know, you know, certain amount of years so that we can then, you know, and so here, what you see up here, um, these are the pipeline of the potential candidates. So as you can see, these are all students that have taken the required coursework, or I'm sorry, are, that are currently taking the required coursework um, that could potentially also, when they become 12th graders, could get the seal of biliteracy. Um, so, so that's just you know, to, um, to you know, show you that there's that pathway um, that's already being built, and that you know that certainly these students are eligible for that. Okay. Now, um, so in terms of awards and, and ensuring that students, um, again, that, that this is, so the ultimate goal is to be bilingual and to receive the biliteracy. So here, um, our goals, our expectations are that 100% our, our of our kindergartens, kindergarten students who um, enter our dual language or, or, or um, biliteracy programs will receive the, um, the basically commitment award. Um, and then we're targeting approximately 70% of our fifth graders and 70% of our eighth graders, and then of course, 100% of our of our 12th graders, with the um, with the added caveat that we are going to be looking at those other students that may not necessarily be enrolled in the classes, but that they were in the past. Um, and so then we that's so basically these are our goals for this year. So before I turn it over to Teresa, just something to talk about um, the load. So in looking at the load, and again, just kind of the structures that we currently have in place, um, so we have many students that speak another language that don't necessarily have higher level courses in order for them to receive the seal of biliteracy, at least according to CDE. We're having conversations with CDE, but of course that's gonna take a little bit longer. But we feel that it's important that these students be recognized as well. So what we're attempting to do, I mean, we're hoping to do is to at least possibly do like a, have like a certificate of bilingualism where these students who take the load, if we add an additional um, uh, writing component um, so that they can, that they can demonstrate proficiency in, in writing in their language, um, then there's a possibility that these students where we may not have an AP course, for example, in Somali, can still get a certificate certificate of bilingualism where they're being recognized for the language. And so that's, again, also something that um, is in the works right now, and we're trying to figure out what would be the rubric, what would be the, you know, the criteria for that. Um, and then, and it, meanwhile, we're still having conversations, of course, you know, with CDE and, and, and try to figure out if, if there's a way to um, more formally, um, you know, give these students, um, you know, the, the credit that they deserve for speaking two languages. And then Teresa will talk about the logistics in terms of our numbers and, and you know, what the, with our load test. And yeah, thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, there's an informal uh, certificate that some students are holding um, there in the picture at Stanley uh, Middle School who did pass the load and they were recognized. So we have an informal way of recognizing their, their language and their abilities um, to speak in both languages. So um, what you see here is the top five languages that were tested in our district, the amount of students who, who tested and passed. Uh, you can see that over 1,700 students were, were tested and so this is a big win for us. We're really proud of the fact that so many students um, are demonstrating proficiency in their language. And then these are the um, additional languages that were tested. We have um, 14 um, languages that we are currently testing and that was expanded from six that we formerly had last year. 
Um, as, as Sandra alluded to, this idea of aligning our course of studies, our coursework, our pathways um, in language from TK to 12 is a very in-depth conversation. It is one that we are looking forward to to continue on, it's uh, sometimes difficult. There are many caveats and um, it's very strategic. It's something that we um, really look to and listen to the input from our stakeholders, our schools, our students, and our families. We are looking to uh, align in a strategic way what we offer so that, and we're also looking at um, working, in fact, uh, we had a conversation tonight with uh, Dr. Wendy Rankber to come up with maybe even a visual of what those course sequence would look like and those pathways would look like for our families and our students to make it more comprehensible and understandable. So we're really um, looking forward to this. This is in the works. This is part of our um, efforts to um, make those pathways clear and understandable and that students know when they enter in this school, they'll follow a line and ultimately receive the seal of literacy. So, um, and that we, has to do with just solving the problem that we had dual language pathways yes. sort in not, not situated in ways that were planned at a central office level. So they would pop up in different places and a student would take a, a language pathway and then it was a pathway to nowhere. It, 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 it didn't articulate to middle school or high school. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes it was strategically planned, sometimes it wasn't. And now you're looking at that comprehensively district-wide, looking at our pathways, working with, as you said, Dr. Rankber and Dr. Julie Martel Dr. and the Ola office. And the, so we have a pathway by definition has to go somewhere. And so it's yes. important that we look at that. We've outlined where we're making sure the pathways actually go Thank somewhere. Thank you for the clarity. Okay. Um, I was I just in my head think like, yeah, you know that sometimes kids would graduate from an elementary school and have nowhere to go in middle school and then yes. it would restart again in high school. Uh -huh. So there was this gap. And I was so just outlining the problem no, that you were so you. expertly solving <laughs> and making sure people know what you're addressing. Um, so what you see before you is a series of dates where we are having these conversations um, at with stakeholders at the cluster meetings, and I know that um, Dr. McQuarrie um, brought up the idea of cluster meetings, and I find that to be an amazing place for us to share ideas, gather ideas, listen to our stakeholders, and have those opportunities to really be down at the site level and understand the intricacies of that particular cluster. So those are very um, helpful. We attended Hoover, and you can see that there's more on the way, and um, we're thinking about also inviting some other stakeholders to these conversations that we know um, would would probably really appreciate it. I think uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, we're also really p proud to announce that we um, originally, with your support, have um, purchased some curriculum for our dual language schools for our K-2 schools. We purchased curriculum for 11 of the schools. Um, we have gotten amazing reports from the teachers. They really love and appreciate having that support. Um, with your continued support, we'd like to extend the curriculum to f continue and fill the rest of our dual language schools so that each school would have the Spanish curriculum that they need to support their students K2 and then additionally three through five so that we would have a consistent um, course of study for them as well. So would that include Gage Elementary School? Yes. Okay, because a, a recent visit to the school, they said that was one of their challenges is developing the curriculum. Yes. So for their Spanish immersion program mm -hmm. at Gage. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Just adding to that, um, as at the Barnard um, um, a Chinese Mandarin immersion where we go to middle school to high school, uh, after reaching into these upper grade levels, they're also having difficulty getting curriculum materials. So I'm sure working on that as well. Yes, we um, have engaged in that conversation tonight at ICC, so thank you. <laughs> we are aware and, and we appreciate the patience and we are working um, together and figuring out how we can do this um, because we do know and understand that that is something that is quite important. So um, we just would like to state publicly that we will continue to work with um, our facilities design and um, stakeholders as well as Dr. Martell to continue the, and continue our conversations at the cluster meeting to get input, feedback, and listen to what our, our schools and families are looking for so that we can meet 
um, their expectations, as well as prepare our students um, to be fully multilingual and prepared for uh, college and civic life. Um, our next steps are to broaden and continue deepening those conversations with instructional cabinet, uh, moving forward on our vision to the pathways and receiving the, the pathway awards as well as the seal of biliteracy, uh, professional development, and um, developing common assessments at the school site so that they will be able to monitor um, the progress of their students. Great, thank you, Sandra and Teresa. We've got one speaker, Francine Maxwell. Three, three minutes, Francine. What? Oh, yeah. I'm not going to take all that. I just wanted to, um, Francine Maxwell, I wanted to appreciate your slide on February 8th and ask if you could do a little bit more promotion for the Morris Cluster meeting because a lot of parents, they don't um, normally attend, but if they knew that you were coming, that would be a selling point for them to be able to change their schedule. We have a lot of Tagalog parents that would like to um, get involved and that would be something that we could jumpstart our Morris Cluster to be, get bigger and get involved if we knew and we could celebrate and promote that that particular office is coming. Also, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding the fact that I have Africans, not African American children attending Lincoln and there's no support. No one has reached out to Walter Lamb um, to give them the support that they need with their language, with different things. So I'd like to um, ask if your office could just send out a general email to all high schools. Are you having students that need help so that we can reach out to other community partners? I don't expect every principal to know every community asset that we have because Walter Lamb is an asset. And if you're in the Crawford cluster, then you know Walter Lamb. But when you're in another high school, you don't know about somebody else's asset. So it would be nice if you could let all principals know, come and ask us so that we can point you in the right direction. Because it seems to me that we're having people in different positions and once they get in their positions, they begin to act as if um, everything is a silo. Um, my board trustee spoke about she wants us to support them. She wants us to get involved. But when somebody makes six figures, I expect them to walk out of their office. I expect them to get in their car. I expect them to drive somewhere. I'm extremely positive. And yes, I support someone. When you bring me the problem, I am a complainer. But I'm a solution-based complainer. So for every complaint that I have, I have a solution. So um, I've talked exhaustingly with Kevin so that we can begin to have a conversation about a mobile nurse, mobile fingerprinting, so that the community can get more involved. People cannot drive to Normal Street if you don't have a car and if you don't have a bus pass. But if you brought fingerprinting from the school police to the community, to the cluster meeting, people could get fingerprinted so that they can volunteer in their cluster schools. The nurse could go to the cluster and she can check everybody's TB. So yes, for every complaint, there is a solution that the district can implement if they so choose. But as far as, um, like I said, we talked about Tagala, just please promote so that Morris Cluster, if they know, we can promote. Also, if you could just ask all the principals um, the fact that you don't know the different partners that we have that can help because I just found out about some Africans at Lincoln that are struggling. Some of them feel like they're being bullied. And so there's hygiene issues. The community can step in and work, but all you have to do is ask. If we don't know what they need, we cannot provide what they need. But trust and rest assured, there's community members, community partners that if we knew what they needed, they'd get it. Board member questions and comments. Dr. Whitehurst, Payne. First of all, I, I would like to uh, commend uh, Dr. Mattel uh, for her work with the Morse Cluster uh, because this past school year uh, she went out and did workshops with them to uh, discover these problems where we had elementary schools such as Audubon, I believe, that had the dual immersion and then there was no place for the children to go after they left that school. And so her work has yielded on some of this, these data to show that we have gaps as we're going along the continuum. Uh, so I think she's been uh, very instrumental in supporting that. 
but I do acknowledge uh, Mrs. Uh, Maxwell's point that we do need to advertise. We need to ensure that schools know and that they're given the support at uh, a Morse cluster meeting uh, that came out that a lot of the principals don't know uh, when these meetings are being held. So if we can find a way to get the information out to the schools so that they can then uh, advertise. Uh, in terms of uh, actually having someone to come to the community to support uh, folks being fingerprinted, et cetera. Uh, the principal at Porter indicated that uh, she has been creative and actually hired a bus to pick people up, to take them to get their fingerprints, et cetera. But I think overall, if we work together to find ways and solutions, we can do that. But I really would like to see that, uh, and back to another point about Lincoln High School, uh, and this is true for all of the schools. I've said to the superintendent and um, to uh, Stacy Monreal that uh, we need to know what the population looks like at Lincoln at every school in this district. Um, because if you look at Lincoln, uh, as I understand it, 30, um, we just have 20% or 300 out of the 1,500 students are African Americans. And um, we have a 77% or almost 1,200 students are Latino. And if we only address the African American issues, we're not addressing the African, um, the Africans issue, we're not addressing the Latino issues. So it has to be comprehensive. It cannot be just focused on only one group. It needs to be focused on every group that's there. And um, that's what it means to bring everybody into the equation. And uh, I wanna thank you for bringing this forward, but I would also encourage you to please get the information out to the schools so that they can move it to the next level. Absolutely, we will definitely work on that tomorrow. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I just wanna thank you so much for all your work. It's really making a big difference over the last many years. Uh, a lot of uh, challenges have been overcome because you guys are actually getting into the schools and helping uh, the teachers to be more prepared to uh, maximize the levels of learning for the students in the dual immersion and a lot of the newer schools that we've expanded our dual immersion programs into. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I really applaud you getting curriculum into these 11 schools. And you know, if there's anything that we can do to try to understand how to get the curriculum into the additional schools by next year, that would really be helpful. Um, and if there's outside sources of revenue that are required, I'm not sure the expense. I don't know if, you know, we, you know, we might want to broaden our horizons to try to uh, figure out how to make it happen uh, for next year. We definitely appreciate that. Of course, um, you know, with the budget, we don't really know. So that certainly would be something that Superintendent Martin would, we you know, we would have to have those discussions. But uh, absolutely, we yeah. can broaden our horizons and but figure out how to do this. Right, but uh, yes. you know, to the extent that maybe we, you know, that maybe uh, it, we can get some numbers, and then maybe we can try to reach out to folks in the community that would like to help support public schools in San Diego in this way. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra and Teresa. Uh, very important um, curriculum uh, for me, developing uh, world languages and cultural appreciation, cultural understanding, will take us a, a, a long way in terms of developing uh, greater civility within our own community as well as greater understanding through the, uh, the world. Just to get a sense of uh, a reminder of where we are with our students, we have students who are in our schools who are born in 163 different countries. And that's uh, so the United States and 162 other different countries. So we have a very diverse student population. I want to make sure we're acknowledging the language and the culture these students bring with them. I believe they bring 70 different languages uh, at, when they arrive at our in our school system. So in reaching, uh, making uh, a comprehensive approach uh, uh, to go back to uh, Trustee Whitehurst Payne's comment that in terms of we have our. our Latino and our African American communities, we also have the uh, high percentage of our students are coming from our Asian, South Asian, and Pacific Island countries, more so there uh, than, uh, and from, uh, well, we have 33% are from our Mexico and, and, and southern border uh, countries. So we do have a, a major, major challenge in developing a curriculum that um, 
expand uh, their current language so that they can get by literacy uh, as, uh, is, is very, very important and, and I want to commend you for doing that. I have a question on slide five and a couple of others, I may have missed it. Uh, on slide five it talks about the uh, one, uh, uh, 100 ninth grade graders who are on in the pipeline uh, yes. as opposed to uh, 10th and 11th grade at you know, almost 600 and, and, and 548. What, what's the dip there? Um, so these are students who are taking advanced level courses. So there's less than ninth grade because, so this technically, so these 100 ninth graders are actually really advanced. So they're either in um, honors 7-8, AP um, language or IB Spanish. So that's why there's, so that's why you can see that it increases. So it's really coursework that we're looking at right now. Um, so these, so that m number increases as students go up in the grades because just, you know, more of them are ready for that level of coursework. Okay, and I may have missed, but what's the difference between the language other than English and the seal of biliteracy? So the language other than the so the lot is um, is a high school it, it, okay so it, it's high school requirement right. and possibly A through G depending on the college but that satisfies the two years of um, the high school requirement to get a diploma um, the seal of biliteracy says that you exactly and it's usually higher levels of of language so it's honor seven eight AP and IB. So that's, that's the difference. And one, one last question. What can we do where we maybe have less than a class load of students, but they want to learn a language? Like maybe 16 students want to learn Japanese uh, and they're at our high school. What, uh, or what, 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 what are some of our options to encourage language acquisition when we don't yet have the numbers to support a, a full class? So there's options online, but of course to learn a language online is probably not the best way to do it. I know that it's been done in several high schools, um, so at this point that's one option that students have. They can take another, um, the coursework online. Okay, so that's our, our IHI is prepared for that? Um, I don't remember, I, I believe it's, I believe it's through IHI, uh, there's, yeah, I believe it's I high because I'm trying to remember if it's the okay. one because I know one of them is to 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 get credit recovery and then there's the one I believe I high is the one that enhances. So I think I think don't quote me on that, but I think it is through I high. Thank you. Yeah, um, and you said we have students from 163 countries. That's pretty amazing. Do we have anybody from Vanuatu? Yes. Really? <laughs> 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 um, well, and, and I'm glad also that you referred to world languages. I mean, we used to talk about foreign languages, but these languages are anything but foreign here in, uh, in San Diego. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things about Vision 2020, we said we want all of our students to graduate being able to communicate in, in two languages, of which English would be one. Uh, and so we have these two groups, those who come to us speaking another language and are learning English, and we want to reinforce their first language, and then we have the students who are speaking English who we want to, uh, to pick up another language. And um, I know that sometimes we have, for example, for Spanish speakers, occasionally I've heard of classes that are Spanish for Spanish speakers, so that you know, they're, they're conversational in Spanish, but they're not uh, as, as literate with reading and writing and so forth. Uh, and so I think with these numbers, we could look at potentially having some of those uh, advanced classes for students of other languages because um, obviously you can give them a certificate in terms of being able to speak the language but actually being able to become more broadly uh, proficient in it I think would be a good thing. And, um, and then the other thing is with, um, with there has to have been a pretty big expansion of world language classes at the high school when we, when we went to A to G, I don't know how many uh, extra or additional uh, language teachers we, we hired at that point. But, uh, and I haven't heard much about this, but I'm, I'm certain there were a lot of challenges because all of a sudden there was a large group of students who had never taken a, for, uh, a world language and had uh, maybe not even contemplated and now were actually required to do it to graduate from high school. 
uh, which also puts a you know particular burden and responsibility on the teachers to make those classes very alive and interesting. Can mm -hmm. you can you tell me anything about what's been going on with the basic? world language classes for high school students? Yes, so um, we are planning a professional development, as a matter of fact, that we will be um, holding in February, and that's where we are going to, um, the focus will be how does um, world language and the world language class support Common Core? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's the first, so that's what we're, we're gonna bring to the teachers together um, so that they can you know collaborate and, and then be able to assist with, you know, I, again, in strengthening Common Core and also maybe if if certain schools have project-based learning or whatever the focus of the school is, then how does the foreign language or the world language fit into that equation? Now, in terms of uh, making classes lively, I was a, 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 a Spanish teacher during that time when it when it switched, and I had you know, all of a sudden there were these big classes because now everyone had to take two um, years of Spanish. But um, so for me, it was it was quite. Um, I actually I did go through some of the you know PD that was that was offered by the district and and a lot of it is is just you know making your class your your language teaching in the target language so that was one of the changes because you want these students to to find it engaging and by teaching mm -hmm. grammar is not gonna you know that's not gonna mm -hmm. do it so so we're hoping to have, kind of have that conversation in this professional development how do we make the classes engaging because now students have to take one two and three four possibly three four five six how do we move them from those just the the minimum like the one, two, three, four into higher levels of Spanish. So at my former high school where I taught, many of our students moved on to five, six, and seven, eight. So even if they start um, a world language class in the ninth grade, if they take it for four years potentially, they could end up being bilingual, and that did happen at my former high school. So, um, so I think that's those are that's going to be the focus of our of our professional development in February, and and, and just kind of getting teachers to really think how is it um, that their class is helping students with 21st century skills. That's great. And I think the other issue is, I mean, we have, we're talking about dual language programs and then the, the requirement in high school, uh, but obviously the younger the students start, the better. And so even if it mm -hmm. isn't a dual language program, what, what, what's being done, how is the planning being done to eventually looking at offering languages in, in all of our schools? Well, that's the work that we're doing with strengthening the pathways, and um, and then with we're waiting for you know more guidance from the state for with Prop 58. Um, so we are in you know so we will continue to monitor those those gui that guidance, and then we'll of course working with Dr. Um, Julie Martel and mm -hmm. and strategically looking at um, what schools, what communities, um, you know, will welcome this this type of program and sustain the program because that's really important that they have to welcome the program and sustain it, and then of course the pathway they need to be able to go somewhere after fifth grade and to go into a middle school. What is that program going to look like? What classes are, are going to be offered at the middle school? What classes are going to be offered at the high school? Aside from the AP Spanish language and literature, we're hoping to thread um, a science and a history class you know, from TK all the way through 12th grade. Um, so it's really just working through, um, through just the larger vision of the TK-12 pathway. Okay, that's great. If I might, and if I might add, yes. it's also considering um, the leadership of the school, like Sandra said, the demographics, and then also the qualified teachers, like how are we preparing our teachers and how are we making those connections for that pipeline and that seamlessness and maybe even targeting um, students within our own high schools to, to join in to, um, so we can keep our students here, and I know one particular student who's our DLAC representative who would love to do that to work towards being a teacher in our school district. I, mean, I know it's a challenge to, to offer a lot of languages, and you know, we have the, the years of tradition of Spanish and French and that type of thing, but as we look at these statistics with uh, you know Vietnamese and, and, and other languages, I mean, those are certainly languages that we could, could eventually be offering. And this is a question made for the superintendent, but in terms of the, the students speaking different languages on um, the whole reclassification issue, do we have statistics on for the various divide down by the various language groups? In other words, Spanish speakers and their rate of reclassification versus Vietnamese speakers and their rate of reclassification. Because I think it would be interesting to see uh, with the students of the less 
predominant languages, let's say, are they are they reclassifying faster or slower, or, or what is the case? I don't know that we've looked at it that way, but we certainly can. Yeah. That would be interesting to say, do we reclassify in certain languages at a faster rate than other languages? So I know we could, we could have access to that and break it down right. that way, especially with all the different languages we're assessing in load, it makes sense that we would do that. Right. Okay. Thank you. So I, I think uh, the, I, I very much appreciate uh, this uh, planning and, and the vision of where we're trying to go to actually have pathways that our students can, uh, can complete from elementary school through middle school and through high school. And I think it accomplishes two major strategic purposes of our district. One, of course, is uh, helping you know, students achieve mastery of more than one uh, world language. I think it's also, and that's the work, you know, obviously with uh, Julie Martell. I think it's also a key strategy uh, to provide uh, the neighborhood school as, uh, you know, as a, as a choice that more and more parents want to make. I, I think part of the reason that we, uh, you know, might be losing some students from from their neighborhood schools and their. Uh, uh, their feeder patterns is because they'll start with a dual language program in elementary school and right. then it's not offered. And they have to go follow somewhere. And then somewhere. you gotta go someplace, someplace right. else. Take a bridge. So I, I think it's uh, fantastic, this work that you're doing. I'm a little unclear about where we are at this stage in the planning process. So we've identified a number of clusters that we wanna create these pathways. Are we hoping that we're gonna see these pathways um, fully functioning at some of these clusters next year? Where, where, kind of what's the timeline? Uh, yeah, so we have, so Bell is pretty close. Mm -hmm. We have had many conversations as stated, and um, so now uh, we are in the planning stages. We um, currently submitted um, the course numbers um, into ICC so that they can have access to the course numbers. Yeah. Um, they're, we're still working through some of that in terms of the curriculum, but then, but we, so, um, uh, What's what's Precious last name? Um, the pr pr principal from from Bell, um, Precious or what? What's her? I can't remember her last name. I'm so sorry. Jackson. Yeah, there you go, Jackson, Principal Jackson. We have been in contact, um, and so so the next step is for us to go down to Bell and then figure out some of the logistics. Um, but that's that's pretty close to to being to to offering that we probably will be offering the slim class, meaning the Spanish language immersion class at Bell next year. Um, that's so that's that's one one pathway that may um, solidify by next year. And then we have conversations, um, you know, that need, still need to happen. Um, we were hoping um, schools, um, Clark has, already has um, something that, you know, that they, they already offer a bilingual course, but now we might, we might uh, I guess, give them the opportunity to offer the SLIM course, which is, um, you know, now it's, it's, it's really leading from, from the pathway. And then there's conversations with other schools that, you know, we haven't yet solidified but at least, you know, Bell is, is closer. Do we have a goal of, say, in two years or three years that we would have the pathways up and functioning in all of the clusters that you've uh, We're in phases, uh -huh. um, and I think as we get more direction from in terms of Prop 58, and, you know, then we can maybe solidify that. We do have a preliminary plan, um, but it's not, I mean, it, it would be in phases because it, again, you know, goes back to teacher credentialing, um, you know, curriculum. So we have to be able to support the school sites with everything that they need in order for it to be successful because we want strong programs. So we're working to, to strengthen um, our dual language programs that we have already and then at the same time open up these pathways at the middle school level, but we want them to be just as strong as the ones in area five. But the ultimate so, goal is in each cluster we will have yes, them. And, exactly. and, and by when, I'm looking at Dr. Martell, I don't know if she has an exact timeline, by when, but there is a plan for every cluster to have a pathway. and. I don't know if you're prepared to come up and answer that question right now, because I see you back there nodding your head. <laughs> and, well, Dr. Martel comes up, and Sandra, I know that you're clear about this. Uh, I think that rather than um, sort of wait for guidance from the state with the implementation of Prop 58, I think the intention of Prop 58 is to free up districts to move. Yes. So I think we should move forward with our plan, and that might actually help provide guidance, you know, to the state and to other districts. And, and I guess I'm just thinking more of in terms of funding. <laughs> so that, so yeah, so that's what um, we're we're kind of. But you know, we have a plan. We just need to be able to fund the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. okay. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> well, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so in terms of the dual language immersion programs, um, for example, many of these elementary schools have recently started in those in that program. So for example, Tierra Santa just started this year. So their first year is kindergarten. It's gonna take those years to get to FARB, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. But the plan is that in four or five years, we want those students to go to FARB. And one of the reasons is strategically thinking, most kids want to go to De Portola. Yeah. So we need to have something going into FARB that will eventually go into Sarah. Right. Uh, Fay Elementary School is at TK1, so next year they're going to be K1 and 2, so we have like three or four years before man will be having the Spanish dual language program. I think some, some of the confusion is the biliteracy programs that are in elementary schools and that pathway. The pathways that I've been working on are going into being very strategic about the districts and the leadership as was mentioned up here. The leadership and the school have to embrace these programs. And um, so you've got the Mandarin program that's all the way seventh grade, next year will be in eighth grade. But some of the other programs are still down in the K to three, K to four grade levels. We want to be ready when those kids are exactly. ready. Exactly, and the middle schools yeah. uh, know that they are going to be ready <laughs> and that's going to be the work here to make sure that they are ready to receive the students uh, into middle school and then on to high school. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you talked about dual immersion and biliteracy and how are you well, defining I, those terms? My world is just the dual language programs and, and being strategic about where we place them to increase enrollment and because we want our students to be uh, bilingual. But the biliteracy programs are okay. more in the world of Okay, the referring office. to those who speak another language first. Yes. yes. Okay, that's how you're, def okay. Yeah. All There's right. a distinction. Thank you for, I know you weren't prepared to come up, but you're always prepared. So <laughs> thank you for adding. No, I, I love the work, and you know, we really would love to have a Vietnamese program start at Central, and uh, it's been a challenge to find, actually, it's amazing, but it's uh, hard to find Vietnamese teachers uh, to teach in PSA. that program. I think you're doing a public service announcement yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for a Vietnamese teacher? Yeah. So that's a great... Um, pathway that we think would really uh, be a strong one in that cluster. Let's have another question, Julie. Uh, you talked about vertically moving up from kindergarten uh, into mm -hmm. the middle school. What about the languages we have at, say, high school? Uh, and then starting to pull those down. Uh, we have the, the Portuguese, for example, in, mm -hmm. in, in Point Loma, and I think we have Japanese in Morse and uh, uh, Patrick Henry and in uh, Script Ranch, but at the, the high school level, is there a way to think also about starting earlier? Because we know language is best learned at the earlier age. <laughs> Well, I'd have to I'd have to look at my colleagues over here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so we will okay. So we will definitely have those conversations. We haven't had those conversations sure. yet in terms of going the other route. Um, but certainly, um, thank you for bringing it to our attention. <laughs> and another key, Morris gets brought up quite often. But we would like to have Tagalog or Filipino start in a school in an elementary school. But a school has to want to embrace it and have the leadership and have that program actually offered at Bell as well in terms of an immersion program. The language is offered at Bell, but let's start down in the elementary school. Great, and then just last thing, so you talked about um, students before 12th grade having the opportunity to uh, that we can, you know, kind of uh, give credit to the work that they've done in terms of, is it possible to get to a point that students prior to 12th grade could, uh, would have already qualified for the seal of biliteracy? And I'm thinking particularly in college applications, yeah. you know, students being able to say, 
you know, I've already yes. qualified for yes. the CLFI literacy. Yes, so that's, we are like, one of the criteria for the CLFI literacy that they have four years of English. Yeah. So um, we are looking for um, ways to possibly do that earlier. Of course, with the, with they would still have to wait or somehow prove that they've obviously finished their last semester of, of yeah. 12th grade. Yeah. So, but yes, we are definitely, we were thinking of possibly, well, how can we either the flag or track these students from the ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, um, you know, how do we ensure that they're actually passing other classes and, and and have all that criteria? So, so yes, we are definitely looking into how can we be, how can we basically um, ensure that all students that are taking the coursework end up with the seal of biliteracy. So, there's different ways that we can right. do that, and, and we are looking into different ways to do that. So, so if they had already passed the exams in uh, in that particular language, but they need to finish their English, there might be something about. Seal of bi biliteracy eligible. Right. Or exactly. Like that. So something, some kind of track. Already, yes, yeah. something that, that gives them, because like you, you see, like those 100 ninth graders, yeah. they're already in the coursework. They just have to wait till they finish their, you know, their 12th grade and make sure that they got, have their four years of English and that if they are um, English learners, that they reclassify and certain things that they have to obviously wait for. But if yeah. they have the majority of that criteria in place, um, they, we should be able to somehow, um, you know, be able to track that. Um, and that's what we're looking at right. yeah, to be able so, to do so. So to add on to that, um, we recently have uh, begun conversations with um, Michael Goodbody from the Office of oh, Secondary right. and thinking about a badging system so that students would be receiving a color-coded yeah. uh, symbol towards the seal of biliteracy. So I, I hope that answers your question yeah. that they would be working towards and it would be something we could deliver on. Yeah. Well, Sandra and Teresa, thank you very much. and. Uh, Superintendent Martin, thank you for this item. It's really exciting to the, see exciting. the work that you're doing. I got one more oh, question. One more. So, <laughs> I, I, I can, I can talk about it. <laughs> um, we've talked about the seal by literacy. What about AP and uh, and IB uh, 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 um, uh, testing? And do we do we do we have an AB in Spanish and French? And do we have IB in any any of those other languages? And and what languages are we doing uh, 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 advanced placement? Oh, so I don't have, okay, let's see if I have it here. Um, we are doing advanced placement, so AP courses. Right. Um, AP courses, we have them in Spanish, and it looks like French and Mandarin at this point. And IB Spanish. Uh -huh. And does that mean we have the AP test in those languages too? I think he's asking. So you're asking for for data. Then, so that they, yeah, then we have the classes. Do we have an assessment, or they take? They the take AP? the assessment. That is correct. Um, we don't. We're not prepared. You know, we can certainly get that data for you. So you're wondering how many students get or pass the AP, the AP exam. That's a little deeper than I wanted. He to just know wants to know: sure. Do we have the te if they take the AP? Yes, they do. Language, they do. Do they yes. take the test in that language too? That is correct. They do. Thinking yes. about other uh, AP assessments. Assessments, uh, IB, I guess depending upon where they are. Their language. Uh, so their it, language. yeah, so so there's two ways. So the, either they offer the course at the high school. If they offer um, the course, then they offer well, not the necessarily. So they could either offer the course, and then students have the opportunity to take the exam, or they can actually take the exam without taking the course. Um, however, in order for them to get the weighted um, points that they right. get, they would have to take the course. So it's so it's it just depends on on the community and the school and, and the master schedule and, and what you know what they can or cannot offer. Yeah, if I might uh, just chime in here. A good example is the Language Academy. Uh, they have a French immersion and a Spanish, and uh, that's a K-8. And so in the eighth grade, a lot of those students take the AP Spanish and AP French exams, and many, many years, um, all of them pass it with flying colors because you know they've been immersed for eight years and they're fluent. Um, and so that's a good example of how students can take the AP exam and demonstrate their ability without necessarily having, having ever taken an AP class, per se, in high school. And this is a communications issue, but I think we need to have a lot of videos, of short videos of students speaking all these various languages so people yeah. really realize the, the, yeah. the breadth and depth yes. of the language learning in San Diego Unified because I don't think people realize how much we're doing. That's right. That's yeah. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, folks. Okay, we'll move on to item E2. This is our second reading of our 2017-18 